Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. The date is August 20, year 2021, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Welcome to the Collegiate Gothic series. In trying to untangle the historical roots of the current crisis, I returned to two looming presences in the sciences, namely James D. Watson and his collaborator Francis Crick. Their putative contributions are so numerous and so widely known that I won't bother to review them at this point. I do ask, however, that you will recognize that the Bernaysian system of public relations, advertising, self-promotion was very much in place by the time Crick and Watson came along. In the age of media saturation, why wouldn't these two gentlemen be put through the Bernaysian process of psychosocial control as well? During the 1960s counterculture and through the 1970s, the artist Andy Warhol held up a mirror to this celebrity culture. Daniel Borston, the American historian, came out with a book titled, appropriately enough, The Image. This fundamental shift in the society and the culture arose from the massive political economic investment by the global corporatists of the national security state. As we know today, long after James Watson, Morris Wilkins, and of course Francis Crick walked away with the Nobel Prize, we learned that there was a woman called Rosalind Franklin. She held a PhD from Cambridge, yet she did not share in the prize. Perhaps Dr. Franklin just didn't fit into the storyline that the Masters of the Universe in the post-war period had already scripted out. It is well worth our while, then, to revisit the biographical elements of Professor Francis Crick. It's especially relevant today in 2021, given the biocrisis to which we are being subjected. It is my suspicion that both Crick and Watson were read into the post-war depopulation scheme as envisaged by the lords of the universe. More specifically, I am interested in the pivotal moment when Francis Crick and his wife moved to San Diego, California in the United States of America. Finally, take special note of what Crick has to say about communicating with extraterrestrial intelligence. More importantly, perhaps, take note of how Crick takes credit for coming up with the concept of directed panspermia. The following excerpt is drawn from the 1988 autobiography by Francis Crick, titled What Mad Pursuit? A Personal View of Scientific Discovery. In 1976, I decided to go to the Salk Institute on a sabbatical. The Salk, the full title is the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, is situated a little back from the cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean in La Jolla, a suburb of San Diego in lower Southern California. For 12 years, from shortly after the official start of the Institute on December 1, 1960, I had been a non-resident fellow, effectively a member of a visiting committee, and indeed I had been involved with it even before it started. In the very early days, Bruno Bernowski and I would fly from London to Paris to consult with Jonas Salk, Jacques Monod, Mel Cohn, and Ed Lennox on such fascinating topics as the bylaws for the proposed institute. The president of the Salk Institute, Dr. Frederick de Hoffmann, went to great efforts to tempt me to stay on there. Eventually, he persuaded the Kiekhefer Foundation to endow a chair for me. I resigned from the Medical Research Council. Odile and I took up residence in Southern California, where we have been ever since. California is effectively bounded on the east by the desert, on the west by the Pacific, on the south by Mexico, and on the north by the state of Oregon, where it appears to rain much of the time. California is almost twice the size of Britain, has a little less than half the population of the UK, and is appreciably more affluent. It has a large and impressive system of universities. Odile and I are resident aliens 
immigrants, that is, though we remain British citizens. An immigrant doesn't have a vote, but otherwise has all the privileges and duties of a U.S. citizen, including paying taxes. Personally, I feel at home in Southern California. I like the prosperity and the relaxed way of life. The easy access to the ocean, the mountains, and the desert is also an attraction. There are miles of lovely beaches to walk on. Out of season, they are usually almost deserted. The mountains are only an hour away and are higher than any in the British Isles, which is not saying much, and often have snow on them in the winter. The highest ones look down on the desert. In spring, if there has been enough winter rain, the desert bursts into flower. Even at other times, it has a strange fascination, partly because of the subtle colors and the wide expanse of sky. In spite of the almost ideal climate, scientists here seem to work hard. In fact, some of them work so hard that there is no time left for serious thinking. They should heed the saying, a busy life is a wasted life. I feel much less at home in the rest of America. New York seems almost remote to me in both distance and atmosphere as London now does. My feelings about New York and California are thus just the reverse of Woody Allen's. Woody loves New York and hates California. According to him, it's only cultural advantages that you can't turn right on a red. But then he seems to enjoy what we in the West call East Coast tension. Molecular biology had not stood still in the 10 years since 1966, but mostly it had been a period of consolidation. Perhaps the most striking discovery was the retroviruses, RNA viruses, that were transcribed onto DNA and incorporated into chromosomal DNA. The key finding was made independently by Howard Taman and David Baltimore. For this, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1975, sharing it with Renato Del Becco, who is now at the Salk Institute. The virus that causes AIDS is a retrovirus. Without this pioneer work, it would have been difficult to make any sense of AIDS. Although I did not appreciate it, molecular biology was on the verge of a massive step forward, caused by three new techniques, recombinant DNA, rapid DNA sequencing, and monoclonal antibodies. Critics who previously had argued that few practical benefits had come from molecular biology were silenced by the realization that, with these new techniques, one could make money out of it. I shall not attempt to describe these very important advances in detail, nor the remarkable results that are now appearing almost every day, mainly because I have not been directly involved in them myself. I decided that the move to the Salk Institute was an ideal opportunity to become closely interested in the workings of the brain. For many years, I had followed parts of the field at a distance. I first heard of David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel's work on the visual system from a footnote in an article in the literary magazine Encounter. I realized that if I were ever to study the brain more closely, it was now or never, since I had just passed 60. It took me several years to detach myself from my old interests, especially as in molecular biology, surprising things were happening all the time. One of these surprises was the discovery that, in many cases, a stretch of DNA coding for a single polypeptide chain was not continuous, as we had assumed, but was interrupted by long stretches of what appeared to be nonsense sequences. These sequences, now called introns, were eliminated from the pre-messenger RNA by a process called splicing. The resulting messenger RNA, with all the sense bits, called exons, now joined together, was then exported to to the cytoplasm so that it could direct the synthesis on the ribosome of the protein it coded. Such introns were found mainly in higher organisms. In our own genes, the nonsense sequences, the introns, were often longer than the meaningful ones, the exons. Introns were much sparser in those higher organisms, such as the fruit fly Drosophila, that had rather little DNA. And in primitive organisms, such as bacteria, introns hardly occurred at all, and then only in special places, small introns in transfer RNA genes. 
It was also discovered that not all of the stretches of DNA between genes was necessarily very meaningful. Much of our DNA, perhaps as much as 90%, appeared at first sight to be unnecessary junk. Even if it had some use, its function probably did not depend on the exact details of its sequence. Leslie Orgel and I wrote an article suggesting that much of it was selfish DNA, a better term might be parasitic DNA, that was not there for the sake of the organism, but for its own sake. Richard Dawkins had already made this suggestion very briefly in a book of his called The Selfish Gene. Leslie and I suggested that this selfish DNA had originated, on many separate occasions, as DNA parasites, which hopped from one place to place on the chromosome, leaving replicas of themselves embedded in the host DNA. After a time, many of these sequences would be made meaningless by random mutation and then, gradually, over a long period, would be eliminated by the host cell. Meanwhile, new parasitic sequences might start to invade the host DNA until eventually a rough balance would be reached between host DNA and parasitic DNA. Whether all this is really true remains to be seen. The possible existence of such selfish DNA is exactly what might be expected from the theory of natural selection. You are no doubt familiar with the idea of a parasite, such as a tapeworm, but you might not at first accept the idea that a molecule too could be a parasite living in your own chromosomes. But why not? Notice that the existence of introns came as almost a complete surprise. Nobody had clearly postulated their existence before experimenters stumbled on them by accident. Introns would probably have been discovered earlier if they had existed to any appreciable extent in E. coli or in the coli phages. There was no hint of them from classical genetics, even in an organism such as yeast on which relatively high-resolution genetic mapping had been carried out. Introns are just the type of thing that is often missed by a pure black box approach, that is, when only the behavior of the organism is looked at rather than looking inside the organism itself. During this period, I also wrote a scientific book for lay readers on the origin of life. Leslie Orgel and I, while attending a scientific meeting on communicating with extraterrestrial intelligence, CT, CETI, held near Yerevan in Soviet Armenia in September 1971, had hit on the idea that perhaps life on Earth originated from microorganisms sent here on an unmanned spaceship by a higher civilization elsewhere. Two facts led us to this theory. One was the uniformity of the genetic code suggesting that at some stage life had evolved through a small population bottleneck. The other was the fact that the age of the universe appears to be rather more than twice the age of the Earth, thus allowing for life to have evolved twice over the simple beginnings to highly complex intelligence. We called our theory directed panspermia. Panspermia, a term first used by the Swedish physicist Savante Arrhenius in 1907, is the idea that microorganisms drifted to the Earth through space and seeded all life on Earth. We used directed to imply that someone had deliberately sent the microorganisms here in some way. The chief difficulty in writing a popular book about the origin of life is that it is mainly a problem in chemistry, mostly organic chemistry, and almost all laymen dislike chemistry. I understood it all, my mother once said to me about a review I had given her to read, except for those hieroglyphics. However, the object of my book was not to solve the problem of life's origins, but to convey some idea of the many kinds of science involved in the problem, ranging from cosmology and astronomy to biology and chemistry. I myself had a rather detached view of directed panspermia. I still have. And there was even a passage in the book saying what a good theory should be like and why our theory, though not unprovable, was obviously very speculative. The book, published by Simon & Schuster in 1981, was entitled Life Itself. While I considered this title rather too broad for the contents, the publisher insisted on it. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the account, in his own words, of the great Nobel laureate, Francis Crick, 
and how he came to be at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in beautiful La Jolla, California, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. I will further examine the career of one Francis Crick in future episodes of Collegiate Gothic. Thanks again for listening.